it's just wonderful to be able to say that we're helping the United Nations with asset management around the world. And uh, Daniel Platts is the leader of uh, those initiatives at the United Nations, although he has a huge team. His uh, handbook on uh, sustainable infrastructure, uh, it's not his, it's the entire United Nations, um, is something that Jim Dieter has called as good or maybe better than ISO 55000. Um, and that's because they use the ISO 55000 as uh, one of the many foundations of the handbook. But uh, I'll let Daniel Platts uh, describe that further. So please welcome Daniel Platts. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. I hope you can all hear me OK. Usually my voice carries. So um, if I'm too loud, let me know as well. Uh, thank you so much for your invitation here. Um, thank you to the Asset Leadership Network, the National Academy of, of Sciences and Engineering. Um, sorry for the little technical hiccup. Uh, the presentation was a little too big and it didn't make its way through to Mike. So we um, reduced it in size a little bit. Um, there is a little, I'm trying to see, okay. So this is my little tool here. Um, so my name is Daniel Plotz. Uh, my official title, and we always have to be very official at the end, right? A senior economic affairs officer. But um, Mike is correct that I um, am leading uh, within my department an initiative, capacity development initiative on um, uh, infrastructure asset management. And I want to talk a little bit about it today. Um, first, a few caveats. Of course, everything I say here is in my personal capacity. We always have to say that. I'm sure you're used to these uh, caveats in Washington, D.C. Um, I want to talk a little bit about my experience. I am not an engineer, and I've Pretty much believe that all of you here know more about asset management than I do. So you're not going to learn anything from me about asset management, but you can perhaps, you know, um, learn a little bit about what the UN has been trying to do to promote it. My training is an I'm an economist by training, and I've always looked at this issue of uh, local government finance and how we can help local governments around the world mobilize um, more resources, and it just seemed to be uh, an issue that was completely neglected, the issue of asset management at the local level around the world and possibly here too. Um, I'm originally from Germany. I've been at the UN for 23 years now, so a long time. Um, also hold uh, American citizenship, um, but that explains the accent. Um, so the title of the presentation is Promoting Public Infrastructure Asset Management Across the Globe. Um, so the first question would be, why does IAM, it's not the Institute for Asset Management, but Infrastructure Asset Management, uh, matter to the end and or the world? How have we approached the idea of promoting infrastructure asset management around the world? And what are some of the tools? I think Mike just mentioned that we really looked at ISO standards as well. And what are some of the lessons learned? And that last question is really crucial because it's it's really not so much as lessons learned, but challenges encountered. And I'd like to learn from you, from your vast experience, you know, how you think about tackling these challenges. Um, we've been doing this now since 2017, and it has been um, grown over time, but it's still nowhere near where I would like it to be. And uh, part of the problem is um, sustainability and impact and so forth. But we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. So I'm not going to tell you what infrastructure asset management is here, but what I wanted to say is, you know, uh, how do we explain it in our training, right? And so we always say um, public infrastructure assets are assets of value that are essential to the delivery of public services. Um, and we usually gear our training towards the city level. So we're looking at assets that are owned or managed by the local government. However, we quickly learned that you cannot talk just to the local government because the central government is, of course, involved in many assets. Um, you know, federal roads uh, often in, in developing countries, um, water and sanitation is, is, is dealt with at the national level, especially in smaller countries. Um, same with electricity grids. And of course, you also have the private sector involved. Um, but I'd say the, the poorer the country is, the, the less involved is, is, is the private sector often, um, because it's just not very profitable to invest into infrastructure uh, over the long term in, in very challenging uh, conditions. And what is infrastructure asset management, what we say is like, well, you know, you have these things of value, like roads and water and sanitation systems and transport and whatnot, and you need to monitor it and make sure it retains its value. And with value, we mean, of course, value to the public, making sure that, you know, the, the people that you are serving really um, 
get the most of, of the facilities. Um, so that's how we explain it. And, and why does it matter? We always, there's little hard data really at the global level on this, but we, we, we were digging and digging and digging. And so um, one of our partners, I, I come from the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs. It's based in New York. It's directly under the Secretary General. Um, but one of our key partners is UNOPS, United uh, Nations Office of Project Services. Some of you may have heard about it. They are really the, the contractual arm of the UN. They really do sort of project level oversight. And um, they've done a study together with Oxford University. Um, and they looked at the big UN development agenda. I don't know how many have heard of the sustainable development goals here, SDGs. Okay, I see a few hands, great. Um, it's been one of the more successful uh, you know, uh, PR efforts of the UN, I think. Um, if you go outside the US, if you go to challenging uh, settings in developing countries, people are um, extremely aware of the SDGs um, and often national policies are driven by it. So we make the argument, um, and this is not just you know something we say. If there's a study again with UNOPS, uh, Oxford University, really looking at all of the sustainable development goals, looking at all of their targets. It's a vast agenda, and coming up with I think about 92% of those goals and targets being directly linked to infrastructure assets. So this we hammer home. It's like if if you care about development, if you care about the SDGs, right? You you must. Um, uh, care about infrastructure asset management. Um, there's some uh, somewhat older study now by the World Bank done that looks at what happens when infrastructure is under maintained. I think they focus mostly on roads, um, up to 2% of growth loss every year. Um, and it, I wouldn't be surprised if it's actually higher on that. That's a conservative estimate. Um, another number we like to quote is that, and, and you all know this, that um, if you look at the life cycle of an asset, most of the financing actually happens later, right? During the um, operating maintaining phase, disposal phase. Um, yet, if you look at the discussions on infrastructure around the world, especially at the UN global level, but also domestic policies, right? It's all about big sums of money to invest and build new infrastructure. And that's very, very much important, right? We all need um, to push for that, but there's just very little thought about what we would call life cycle finance. It's a very complex thing to maintain these things over the long term. And how do you make sure that you have uh, the funds available while the assets depreciate to repair it, replace it, and so forth, right? So there's just not a lot of um, work on that there. Um, this is, and the last thing is, um, it's actually not that impressive, I think, but still, uh, because it's both, it, it's, it's, I think the number is actually higher, but this is based on an OECD study that every one um, percent uh, spend, uh, sorry, one dollar spent on infrastructure is as effective as uh, one and a half dollars of, of new investments. And so we just try to like throw these numbers out there to convince people to care, right? Um, and I'm going to jump over that uh, economic, social, economic, uh, and environmental benefits of asset management, um, common sense, right? Uh, it's just, if you have infrastructure assets that are working well, you have better uh, access to services for all, uh, you reduce material waste, you increase the sustainability of assets. Um, the financial thing I just mentioned, but also, you know, of course, assets that are managed well have better revenue potential. Um, you reduce the cost to asset failure and so on. You can go on with that list for a long time. Um, this is usually how the UN thinks about benefits in the economic and social and environmental sphere, right? When we talk about sustainable development, we always talk about the three dimensions of sustainable development. These are environmental, social, and um, economic. So now a little bit about um, the project that I'm that I'm talking about. Sorry, I'm moving away from the microphone. Um, so this is the current, I'm not saying this is the best approach, right? But this is what we came up with. Um, we, uh, in 2017, just a few people at the end were sitting together and wondering what can be done to elevate the issue of asset management, especially at the city level. Um, we had very little funds um, and the UN usually works in very challenging circumstances. So we basically just started out with scoping missions um, and we spoke to a few countries and those that were very, very keenly interested in it, we went to, and it was mostly in Africa. So the first two countries, we focused on were um, Tanzania and Uganda. And, and then it has grown over time. 
So these in-country diagnostics that you see there, that, that sort of circle to the, to the right a little bit, um, is usually how we start, right? Um, and then based on these um, uh, uh, diagnostics, which are basically missions where a team visits cities and spends some time with them, um, we would design customized workshops. They usually last about four or five um, days. I took on talk about them a bit more. Um, and then we have a team that provides some field support, um, trying to visit the cities again and see how they're doing in changing their organizational culture for asset management. Um, what we haven't done enough yet, because it's just a lack of funding issue, is a training of trainers. So how do you, you know, once once you do the training, how do you make sure that there's an institutional capacity in the country to continue with the training, right? Um, and the other issue is the enabling environment at the national level. So how can you provide the incentives at the national level for cities to do better asset management? And even at the national level, those uh, national agencies, how do you make them, uh, uh, how do you turn them into better asset management? That has to do with policies and incentives and so forth. And I'm gonna talk about that um, a little bit more. Here to the right, these are just like um, uh, some pictures. It's interesting, you know, just a very simple thing. When you, when you look at this picture where it says field support, this is actually uh, in Uganda and in, in Gulu, a small, smallish uh, city, not too small, but not, not the biggest one. We usually focus on not the capital cities, but those that get a little less support. And this simple thing that they did, this looks actually quite good. When we first visited them and we asked them for the National Asset Registry and the National Data, they said, okay, let's, let's go down. It's all in the basement. And it was, I mean, it was like, uh, you know, the basement of a hoarder, basically, you know, there was no way to get through those files and whatnot. And we said, you know, I mean, the first step is to clean this up, right? And, and introduce a filing system, um, even before you think about, you know, entering it into an, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and then when we visited them a year later, you know, it, it, it actually looked neat. That's where the picture is taken. Um, so, you know, it's, it was nice to see a little bit of a, ch of, 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 of a change um, and they had a whole nice filing structure and system now in place and a focal point and so forth. Um, this uh, other picture there, uh, training picture, um, let me see where that was. Uh, that was in Bangladesh just about uh, um, in October. And um, the, the people there, you can see it from there um, that are sort of kneeling on the ground or holding the UN handbook. Um, in Bangla, so we had it translated, and that's absolutely key. If you talk to city officials around the world, uh, you need to talk in their language, right? Um, because not everyone speaks fluent English. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to talk about that handbook in a, in a little bit. Um, just to give you an idea of what the environment is like, right? I mean, these are challenging countries, and it has to do with the mandate of our department to help those that need it most. So these are the countries where we're active right now. Um, it, you know, even in, in, in Somalia, Lao, PDR, Costa Rica, Bangladesh, Nepal, Kenya, Uganda. Um, these are all countries where we actually are physically present. We, we went there, we did the scoping missions there, we did the training there. Um, we did a lot of other countries as well, as remotely online training, hybrid training. Right? Um, but these are where the, the, the countries where we really were present and are present um, in the field. So who do we train is, 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 is a big question, right? So um, we want to approach infrastructure asset management as a multi-stakeholder effort. The idea is to say, look, if you really want to do a good job of managing your assets, you need to come together as a team, as a city team on a regular basis. And there are different levels of decision-making. You all know that this is sort of you know, following the military model a little bit, right? Operational, tactical, strategy. And there are different people in the cities that have these, that operate at this dif different levels. And you wanna make sure that you have a good mix of them uh, present. So when we do training, we would invite maybe five, six, seven cities of a country and a city team where we wanna make sure that uh, these roles are present. So you have supervisory staff, but you have the engineer as well. You have a procurement officer, community development officer, because all of these guys are talking about asset management and thinking about asset management on a daily basis, sometimes without knowing it. What they're not doing is talking to each other. Um, and that's what we were sort of trying to change. Um, what are the tools? And, and Mike mentioned it. Um, so what we did is, you know, when, when we learned about municipal asset management and 
and try to figure out what is there, right? Of course, there is ISO. Um, and it's great. I, I mean, we were so happy that it exists, right? But um, for a local government official that has very little time to translate ISO into, you know, daily improvements in how he or she do their work, it is very, very hard, right? So what we did is we, we looked at ISO, um, we looked at um, what Australia did, what New Zealand did, Canada is doing a great job. Um, of course, we learn from all countries, uh, also in, in the US, and try to see if um, there are other guidelines or are there papers, other things that we can use to uh, sort of simplify the concept. And we spend as much thinking about what the content is um, as much, uh, you know, as, as thinking about the style and, and how, do we, how do we do it. So um, we brought together some really, um, interesting people, mostly outside the UN. So I wanted to avoid any bureaucratic language, right? Um, so we have a team of maybe eight or nine authors, key authors um, that looked at different um, aspects of asset management. Um, and it's all online, it's all freely available. It's about a um, 400 page uh, book, but you don't have to read it from cover to cover. Lots of nice pictures, images, graph charts, just to keep the reader engaged. The way it's structured is, we introduce a diagnostic tool. I talk about the scoping missions before, right, that we do. So we actually developed a survey that goes through um, different categories of asset management. And it can be used as a self-assessment tool for cities. It can also be used um, by a, sort of as a more advanced tool if they have the resources to have a consultant or a team there that does it with them. Um, but it's a large set of questions that goes through the registry, through um, the life cycle of an asset, um, through de determining demand, things like that. Um, and we explain in the handbook how to apply this tool. It's available for free uh, in many languages. It's, it's essentially an Excel spreadsheet that has a scoring system attached to it. Um, and then uh, perhaps the most important tool we've pioneered, it's called an asset management action plan. I know there are AMPs and, and SAMs and whatnot, but this asset management action plan is, is much simpler. What we're doing, and this is what we do during the training, we tell them, look, if you had to focus on one asset that you really want to you know, work on as a city team, which would it be, right? And um, we teach them prioritization methods, very simple ones. And so that starts the conversation of the city team, right? It's like, no, I think this is more important. No, that is more important. How can we numerically score it? So once they agree on an asset, like um, whether it's roads or their sanitation plant or you know even a public building that is used for a hospital, whatever it is, we ask them to develop this action plan and we have a template and a guide. And it basically it's, it's an analysis as who is, you know, you start out with big principles for asset management, but then you go into, you know, who's managing the asset, who is the stakeholder, who is impacted, who is interested, what are my current performance goals, how do they line up with what they should be, what is a realistic target, what are some of the actions that we can take over the next few years for this particular asset, without buying a new asset, right, to, to, to monitor it better as a team, um, to, to have interventions, some of them require resources, yes, but mostly it is just about sort of a better monitoring, a coming together um, effort. Um, the, I'd say the second most important tool is the climate vulnerability, vulnerability assessment tool. Um, everyone has to deal with climate change. Uh, very few countries have the resources um, to, to prepare fully and adapt fully to climate change. change. So what can you do to prioritize actions uh, when you look at your assets and how they will be impacted by climate change? How can you assess it? How can you build a decision-making framework around that? We've worked very closely with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities that has just at the same time as we did this, developed their own tool uh, for the municipal level. And the, the, the guy in charge of, of it is uh, uh, now a real uh, integral team of the, of the UN as well. He still works for FCM, but we have him as a consultant once in a while, and he wrote that chapter. So it's, 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 it's quite new and, and quite exciting um, to apply this. Um, the other ones, I'm, I'm not gonna go into detail now. Um, they're just different tools that relate to enabling environment and this, especially the data one is perhaps also worth mentioning where we look at you know how to build national asset um, uh, sorry uh, municipal asset registries registries or even national asset registries um, this is just a, the book is real right it's not just an online book this is a um, picture of it uh, we have it now available in nine languages 
uh, all the UN official languages, which are French, Spanish, English, Arabic, Chinese, and Russian. Um, we'll always have to do that, right? And then we have local languages as well. Um, Swahili, Bangla, Lao, all the countries we work in, we, we, first thing we do is actually translate it. So all the local government officials can actually um, understand it. Here, just a few um, pictures, and I'm, I'm gonna share all this with you. You can spend more time on it. These are sort of different steps of um, this asset management action plan that I mentioned. And you, just by briefly looking at it, you, you see it's, it's basically a gap analysis, right? But the, it, it is very um, structured, it's very detailed. Again, there's a writing guide, there's a template. Uh, we print it out, we put it in front of them. Um, they, they work on a paper or their laptop as a team together. And they, at the end of the training, they present their action plan with concrete commitments um, for action. Um, what we then do is, um, if the action plan meets our basic expectations, we don't we don't edit it. This has to be owned by the local government. Might, if you go to this website that I explained in a minute, we'll see if spelling mistakes and things like that. We, we want to make sure these are owned uh, by local governments. But if they are honest efforts and and uh, look um, substantive, we post them on the web for others to look at. So we have a global repository where you can just, you know, you can zoom in um, different countries, uh, you see different cities, and then you click on it and you'll pull up the action plan, which is like maybe a 15, 20 page plan for one particular asset. And this way cities can learn from each other and be inspired by each other. So um, that's a, a neat feature that we have to just at least within our limited means showcase the good efforts that uh, we're making. So th this is what they look like. Every asset management action plan looks different. Again, it's owned by the cities. This is uh, one from uh, Belize City, for example. They did a very nice job. You know, um, I think this is also from Brazil, if I'm not mistaken. Um, okay, so um, this climate action tool, I don't wanna bore you with the details, but um, these are just sort of images and visuals from the handbook. So you see, you know, what, whatever we try to explain, we make we, we do it very visually. And essentially the point we're, we're driving here is that, you know, like you have certain capacities, but now climate change is here and your, your forecast load is much bigger than the capacity that you have, right? So how can you walk through a decision-making process that within your scarce resources, you allocate um, your resources for climate adaption wisely? You, you may decide for certain assets to do nothing for now and just monitor it, right? And you, you may take action for other assets. But walking through that decision-making process um, is, is not simple. And having the data, getting the data that you need to understand it better is not simple. And we're trying to really use um, data sources there and share data sources that are freely and, and easily um, available. Um, so last two slides, just the challenges encountered. And this is what I would like to you know, put in the room and then maybe hear from you about it, right? Um, and some of it has, has been mentioned. So again, this is a people's story, right? So we want to make sure that uh, it's not just the engineer that cares for the asset. We want to make sure we start a conversation within the city to look at all their assets at the same time and, and take collective wise decision within their limited resources as to what could be done better in terms of maintaining this asset, uh, what should be prioritized. And, and what actions should be taken that haven't been taken, right? Um, but uh, when we wanna look at sustainability of such an intervention, we wanna make sure that when the end leaves or whoever helps those countries, right? That they have the capacity to continue with that training. So we're really trying to link up with universities um, and uh, national training institutes. Uh, our biggest success is perhaps Uganda, um, where the biggest university in Uganda um, introduced a new master's program on infrastructure asset management, and it's based on the handbook. So now, you know, you have new generations doing that. Um, we have a smaller uh, partnership now with Gambia, where there's a local government training institute. We give them a small grant so they can um, put up a new course, a new training on infrastructure asset management for local government officials. Um, the other problems are very big problems any change management person knows them, right? Organizational inertia. So how do you make sure to implement lasting change? Um, this big 
issue of delayed gratification, right? So we everyone sees that it makes sense, but when it comes to allocating small resources to upgraded asset management, that's where you encounter the problem, right? So how do you convince people to um, do incentivized short-term expenditure increases that are tied to much larger long-term um, savings? Um, another problem we are still thinking about is how do you make sure you have the right audience, right? We talked about the different levels, technical, strategic, operational, uh, different departments, uh, you know, Ideally, you know, the bigger, the better you want to think, but you want to make sure that, you know, you have the right people. And it's not just a matter of function, it's also a matter of personality. And sometimes we've, we've, you know, asked people to be asset management focal points in their city, and turns out they just don't want to do it, right? And then there's a much more junior person that is really, really enthusiastic about it. And it might be better to go with that person as long as the leadership, the mayor, the city leadership is okay with that person being sort of the, the focal point that brings the new team together on a, on a regular basis. Uh, we looked at the in, uh, enabling environment. A lot of countries, you don't have that enabling environment. You don't have a proper asset management policy. You don't have proper guidelines. Um, you don't have um, mandatory reporting on, on, on asset data, uh, things like that. So how can we convince the national government um, to, well, I mean, they have to go sort of easy, right? They cannot demand too much at 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 uh, at once but how can we ask them to to move towards um this sort of carrot and stick approach a little bit more where they incentivize governments at the local level uh, to do better job on asset management and then you know the, the last thing is we we've, we've seen there are key areas that are still and maybe you can correct me but we feel they're still under researched right this idea of what is really sustainable asset management asset management looking at the sustainable development goals as opposed to classical asset management. How do you formalize a more SDG or human development focused asset management approach? Um, life cycle finance is a big issue. I've yet to, 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 to read a, a good paper that really walks you through the challenge of a city or a public sector in um, financing uh, asset management over the life, life cycle of an asset and, and how to think about it, how to strategize it, how to think about it from the from the planning phase, starting starting right there and then. And how can we, and it, you know, our job at the end is not to do the research really, but you don't have the capacity for that. We rely on, rely on people like you, but it's, it's it turning it into concrete practical guidance that is helpful, right? And natural asset management is a big issue as well. There's movement there, of course, but you know, how do you um, evaluate a, a, a public forest, right? Or a river basin? How do you make sure that that becomes a, an asset that is being managed well by, by the city? How do you pr promote natural asset management? Um, this is just for you to, um, again, I share that with you to, to ask you to join the, the, the UN community of infrastructure asset management. Uh, we won't bombard you with emails. We bring out a, a newsletter twice a year. That's it, where we just talk about um, some of the countries we're working in. You see here, you know, we mentioned this master's program on IM in Uganda. We talk about our training. We're working with universities, which is exciting. Um, we have um, partnerships with the Un University of Rotterdam, Columbia University in New York, where students are now um, really uh, doing capstone projects um, based on our data, based on our engagement. Um, and it's all free and accessible online. So please um, join it and please feel free to email me. That's my email address. Very easy, plots at un.org. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, before we get to some questions uh, that have come in online, and if anybody else has comments, I'd like to have a show of hands by the people here live and a thumbs up or a yes from the people online. The United Nations is focused on uh, developing nations, but I think almost everything Daniel said applies to federal agencies. How many people in the audience here agree to that? Almost every hand, well, about 75%. And uh, everyone online, if you'd uh, thumbs up or say yes, so we get a, an idea about that. So uh, there's another microphone over there if anybody has any comments or questions. And then um, online, Dia Panjana asks about uh, any 
exploration of the use of natural assets to help with sustainability. Mangroves, is there any exploration or are you seeing that? We just, the ALN just started uh, exploring uh, the management of natural assets in uh, 2023 with our tree storm, where we looked at uh, how uh, to uh, use asset management to assist the tiny forest movement as a way of helping people understand about asset management. What are you seeing, Daniel? Yeah, no, that, it's a very exciting um, area. As I mentioned, it's still sort of not as well researched as other areas where we feel comfortable at, at the end to sort of turn it into a handbook or, or guidelines. You know, we had, as I mentioned, we had ISO, we had a lot of good work that was done already um, for that. Um, but it comes up, right? I mean, just to give you one example, um, a, a very interesting one, in, in Uganda, um, a big issue like in, in many African countries is, is, is land, land titles and public land and what to do with it. Uh, so, you know, there's municipally owned land uh, that is um, uh, an asset, of course, that has to be managed, but often it is contested, right? So what, what we said is, okay, what about if you focus on that land that is clearly public, is not contested, still as it is, and, you know, we give you a little bit of money to um, do a demarcation with trees. So they started planting trees around the public land, which of course has sustainability benefits and all of that, but it was a natural, non-aggressive barrier now to protect the land of the public, right? So you see these, um, and, and I know that our colleagues from UNCDF, that's another agency we work with, um, they've done some great work in promoting mangrove uh, forest um, at the at the local level as well. So these these things come up as very innovative, concrete solutions. Uh, what is still missing is sort of um, uh, you know this idea of how do you evaluate it? Um, you know how much resource do you put into it? So sort of formalizing it a little bit more so we can actually make sure it is included in every municipal or national asset registry in a meaningful way. Excellent. All federal agencies have trees, some more than others. And uh, it would be great to be able to uh, have some type of information sharing or interaction between the agencies and the UN. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how the UN can work with uh, member states? Um, so, I mean, the UN is its member states, right? So that's what we like to say. Um, and uh, the the way the UN is structured is um, it has this the the secretariat based in New York with all member states, pretty much the whole world um, present, right? And so the 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 easiest way is um, for you if you have connections to the to the US government, State Department, USAID, to to highlight this issue of infrastructure asset management as a sustainable development issue. Um, I think it's it's something that you know we've we've started it as sort of on the side. We we've mobilized some money, and now we're trying to feed it into the intergovernmental discussions. But often, you know, like when I say, okay, what about you know here's this declaration, that declaration, a resolution, a big uh, you know um, communique that member states, including the U.S., of course, negotiate over months. Um, just bringing in the word of infrastructure asset management is often a struggle not because they are against it, but because they drop it easily in favor of something else. You know, it's being, what I've experienced now is it's being used as a, a negotiation tool almost. There are many other concepts like that, you know, like you put something forward, you pretend you care, but then you drop it easily because, you know, you, you care about another term or whatnot more. So these are negotiation tactics. Um, what we need to do is really put it on the on the agenda that this is this is a key sustainable development issue. And I'm I'm always struck why why they don't don't see it. I mean, there's so much talk about uh, you know I don't know if you heard that term from moving from billions to trillions. You know this idea of really mobilizing trillions of dollars to, for for new infrastructure. It's very little talk about what happens after the the construction phase, how to make it more sustainable, and that's just missing. And that's something you know like if if it gets on the agenda of a member state, it gets on the agenda of the UN. It's as simple as that. And if it's a powerful member state like the US, of course, um, um, e even more so. So um, it, it's just a matter of, of you, I think, highlighting these issues through your connection with, with, with the government. And once the government says this is an important issue, the UN Secretary goes and does it. Excellent. So one of the great things about the US federal government is despite all the 
political machinations that go on that you described very well. The executives at agencies get it done. They actually are very good at being blind to that political aspect mm -hmm. and doing what's good. So we, the ALN strongly recommends uh, federal executives who are able to reach out to Daniel. His uh, email is up there. And uh, we would hope that uh, this and other activities can uh, assist the United States to uh, have its aligned interests with the United Nations met on a global level. So thank you, Daniel, for coming you down so to speak with us. Thank you.